Now, I invited Defence Minister Maurice Payne onto the show, but she rarely gives interviews. I guess she must be shy. But, luckily, former Defence Minister Kevin Andrews has agreed to come on and for his first national interview since the beginning of the election campaign. Thank you very much. Pleasure, Andrew. Now, should Australia send warships to sail through the waters claimed by China to assert that those are international waters, not Chinese waters? I don't think we should do anything precipitous at the moment. This requires a prudent, cautious and careful response. We should be in conversation, as I believe we will be, with our allies, with the US, with Japan, uh, with others. Now, the fact is that China under Xi Jinping has become more nationalistic in its language, it's more internally repressive and it's more aggressive externally, and we're seeing this in both the East and the South China Sea. But we don't want to be in a position where we precipitate a clash. We have to be careful and prudent and cautious, and I support that approach. So uh, Stephen Conroy went too far? Look, I think he did. I, I think his comments could be characterised as a bit reckless or irresponsible when what this really requires is some clear thinking about how we deal with China. Yeah, but the problem is China so big, Australia so small. Um, what can we realistically do? Just suck it up? Well, the decision of the tribunal is very significant. This is an international tribunal saying under the international rules-based order, China is out of line. And that is a huge serve towards China. Great. So China's the... just given the two fingers. Well, I think what... So this you is and whose do, army? Almost literally. What, what China is doing is actually forcing all the nations of the region to come together and to have a common view against what China is doing. Now, whilst it's, this decision wasn't about sovereignty as such, if you read the decision, the award of the tribunal, it's quite clearly said that this so claim to a so-called nine-dash line uh, is very dubious and it hasn't got that claim. It can't simply take uh, what's effectively an underwater reef, build an artificial island on it, and then say we've got exclusive economic zone rights to that area. And they've said, upheld, freedom of navigation as a matter of international law. That's important to Australia because 98% of our trade by volume goes by sea, and one half of that travels through or transits through the South China Sea. I understand it's a big issue, and I understand all the neighbours already agree China's wrong on this. But the point is, a court action is, has got no power unless you send in the bailiffs or whatever, or the police to enforce it. Who is going to enforce this one? Well, I think there's two things we should do, Andrew. One is to continue our routine, regular transit of the South China Sea. Uh, we conduct um, so-called gateway flights missions, and we've been conducting for nearly 35 years now under the Five Power Defence Powers Agreement uh, over the South China Sea and elsewhere in that area. We should continue to do that. Uh, we should routinely, as we've done from time to time, sail our naval vessels through that area. Uh, but Within 12 nautical miles Well, that island? depends on what the island is. I don't think we need to be provocative, but we should simply say that the South China Sea is international waters generally, and we should continue to transit that. But more importantly, we should be now pressing through ASEAN for China to come to the table and conclude a code of conduct for the South China Sea. But this is the point, uh, Kevin, uh, all, all, if you say it's great, you know, we can all reason about it and be rational. The point is China is operating on a different paradigm. It is not giving it up and it is in fact saying, come and take it. China will take notice of what the international community says. Uh, I've been in meetings in the past with China where there is a sense, despite the sort of bellicose rhetoric, that they want to be accepted within the international community. And this is a time when the international community has got the rule of law on side quite clearly now. Uh, the China claim mm. has been thrown out and we should be now being much more assertive in all international forums to say to China, look, if you but want to be there part... Or else? But what's the or else? Well, well... Let's not do anything which is provocative at this stage, Andrew. I mean, as I said, we do conduct the Gateway and mm -hmm. other missions. The United States have sailed destroyers into, into that area uh, a couple of times in the, uh, the last six to eight months or so. We should continue to do everything okay. which is routine, but, but we shouldn't be sailing the Pacific Fleet through the no, South no, no, China that's Sea. not what I'm saying either. But uh, I'm just interested. That China has heard the, 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 you know, the law delivered does know the meaning of, you know, the opinion of its neighbours, and the president today said, uh, I, so what, I'm, this is Chinese. And, and that's the way they operate. I mean, they operate that if there's a, if there's a vacuum, they will uh, 
occupy Who's the today, vacuum? we have to ensure that there's no vacuum. Well, I think, frankly, Obama. under President Obama, uh, America's actions have been too little too late, not just in this region, but uh, elsewhere around the world. What a disaster that presidency has been for world security. But um, meanwhile, we won't have the last of our 12 submarines for 50 years. You and I will be long dead. This really shows how crazy it, well, it is to have a procurement plan based on everything being OK and the same for 50 years. What we have to recognise is that military procurement is a long time. It's a long period from when you decide you want something until you're finally getting it delivered. I mean, if you talk about naval vessels and submarines, uh, when I became the Defence Minister, we came into government, uh, we knew that Labor had not made a decision about submarines for six years. That's another six years before we can actually get the Got first it. one. I put the competitive evaluation process in place to truncate the decision making. But even then, with the design phase and with the building, it's going to be, you know, a decade or more before we get the first submarine. Fifty years. But I mean But that's the last one, Andrew. Yeah, I know it's the last one, but if we decide that Australia's defence needs twelve subs but the last one doesn't come until then. I mean, surely there's a way of truncating that uh, well, so that you could fair, get, in, build them in, overseas. In the defence white paper and in the decision about the submarines, mm. there is a review which is going to occur about the end of the 2020s or early 2030s, as I recall from reading it at the time. Now, uh, it could well be that we will have drone submarines in 30 years' time like we have drone planes today. So that review is important because that means we can make adjustments to that plan program of acquisition if we need to. So these 12 submarines may never eventuate? Look, we can't say at this stage. No, but, but you're, you're saying the there's a review. Is, we could go to drone review, And it's sensible to have that review because otherwise we would be locked into what you're criticising and not getting the last submarine. No, so these are fantasy yeah, submarines. We may no, not, well they're, not, they're not get fantasy. 12 oh, we, No, but what you're saying is that in, we'll have a review in about a decade. It, we could go to drone submarines. So what are these 12 submarines? It's well, just that, some that's, sort of idea. No, that's the proposal at the moment, and that will no doubt be the subject of the actual contractual negotiations with the French to build uh -huh. them. But it makes sense to have in the plan does. a provision that if technology changes or our needs change, we can then adjust. Yeah, well, I, can you really see us using the sort of submarines that we're being told about 50 years from now? Look, a new I, I, I can't 50. say, and, and any of us would be speculating, but uh, it's important we've got that flexibility. The Zeppelin of the Seas. Yeah, OK. I, I said so much that glance. Um, should we have at least bought the first few overseas to get them sooner? Well, when we put the competitive evaluation process in place, we asked for the costs of an onshore build, an offshore build or a hybrid build. Um, and we had the RAND corporation, uh, admittedly in relation to surface vessels, but also produced a report which said that there was a premium to pay if you had a total build in Australia versus overseas. So we're going to pay more. Down. What I'm saying is paying more, that's already bad enough. Should we have gone overseas and at least got them sooner? Well, whether we had got them much sooner uh, I think is still a moot question because if you look at the submarine we've chosen, uh, it's a version or a variation of the current French Barracuda class submarine. The Barracuda is different in two distinct ways. First, it's bigger than the one we and want, it's... and secondly, it's nuclear powered. So you there is a redesign that you don't have process. To do. That's what I'm saying. You know, if you're going through the Japanese model or something, well, Wouldn't you have got them sooner? The advice on the Japanese was that in relation to the three bidders, the French, the Germans and the Japanese, that the French submarine was superior to the Japanese. Now, the Not end much of the good day, if you're not ever going to get them. No, but at the end of the day, as the Chief of Navy kept saying to me over and over again, this is all about capability. We have to have the best submarine that we can and I accept the advice that uh, right. the Defence has given the government and that is the French It's not much good if it's uh, still on the drawing board when you need them. But listen... Um, I have to ask the election. Would Tony Abbott have done as badly as Malcolm Turnbull? Look, that's moot in the end because Tony Abbott wasn't the leader when we had the election and Malcolm Turnbull was. Um, you know, the, there were poor polls at the time when Malcolm replaced Tony, but it's a moot question in the end. Uh, I think there were mistakes in our campaign, there were issues that arose, uh, and, you know, we've snuck across the line. What mistakes? 
I think that uh, if you look at the issues that were raised with me, the most significant one was superannuation. Uh, the Medicare scare by Labor did cut. I remember going to speak to elderly citizens groups and they were scared about what might happen to Medicare. Uh, and I think you know we probably made some mistakes in perhaps being a bit too complacent about uh, the way in which we conducted the campaign. And I think if we had our time over again, we would have been much more negative and much more quickly. Attacked labour on unions, uh, yes. electricity tax, etc., etc. Uh, the superannuation, uh, you say that was a mistake. Uh, Malcolm Turnbull today said he's not changing it. Well, I haven't seen the detail of it, um, obviously, Andrew, but I will approach it from a principal point of view, and there's a couple of principles in mind. Uh, one is that we should encourage people to be self-reliant. Uh, and if they're self-reliant, then they're not dependent on the state in their retirement. And if you're going to be self-reliant, then there has to be some certainty about planning because people make plans on a long-term basis for their future. And the second is that uh, we historically as a party and as a coalition have been opposed to retrospectivity. Now, I don't know whether the detail will show that there's a retrospective element to that, but I would be very concerned if there is retrospectivity in um, what's actually finally proposed. Yes. Now, so it's not going to change it. Uh, I, and it's not going to reappoint you, it's not going to reappoint Tony Abbott, it's not going to reappoint Erica Betts, is maybe going to give a promotion to a couple of junior Conservatives. Is that enough? Isn't, he saying, isn't there a risk of him actually telling the voters, we're not changing? I think at the moment we have to be honest, honest with the voters, honest with the public, honest with ourselves. You know, one and a half million people who would be usually considered centre-right voters, didn't vote for the coalition, voted for minor parties and independents. We have to be concerned about that. I think we have to be humble. Any sense of triumphalism at the moment will be seen as hubristic by the public and we'll get marked down for it. The Liberal Party, as John Howard said over and over again, is a broad church and has been successful when it's a broad church. So in terms of our approach to policy, our approach to programs and our approach to personnel, it should reflect that broad church, which is the combination of classic now. liberals and conservatives. Well, I th what I would be saying to, to the Prime Minister, which I've said to him personally and I've said to him in his face, I'm not saying anything different, we should always be striving to have the broad church if it goes no, no, but so one way or the I other. I can say that. You, everyone can say, yes, broad church. What I'm saying is, does the party at the moment give the impression to the base, to voters generally, that it is a broad church? Well, you have to look at what the base did. And a significant proportion of the base deserted us. They went to minor parties and independents. Okay. And um, we need to win them back because... Give me, two way, give me two ways you can. Well, we have to ensure that our policies and our programs uh, reflect okay. that. In general, uh, and, I would say, and I would say that the personnel that make up the leadership and the uh, front bench in particular of the party should be a balance of uh, Liberals and Conservatives. By appointing whom? Well... It would make sense to me to reappoint Mr Abbott. I mean, he's a man who's been the Prime Minister of the country. He's got a lot of experience. Uh, he's seen as a figurehead, uh, I think, of Conservatives within the Parliamentary Party. It would make sense to reappoint him. So why is Malcolm Turnbull offering the olive branch? Well, it's a bit early at this stage. I mean, we, we haven't... We haven't actually finished counting for the election. Uh, there's a party room if meeting one. next Monday. And I expect we'll win with 76 or 77 speeds. Uh, this would be a good time to make sure that um, we reach out to ensure that all the strands of political hues that we represent Kevin, are represented in the, the parliamentary chase. party. I'm not saying that Malcolm Turnbull should stop hating Tony Abbott. You know, why should hate someone who's done an injury to is beyond me, but there you go. But surely the man has got to reach out to Tony Abbott instead of whacking him all the time. Well, I think that would be the magnanimous thing to do and I think it would be the practical thing to do in terms of making sure that this party is the party of Menzies, is the party of Howard, is the party that broadly represents both Liberals and Conservatives within the community and if the latest vote is any evidence of that, then a lot of people don't believe it. And we need to regain their trust. We'll only regain their trust, in my view, if we do show that we broadly represent that cross-section of views. You've looked at this guy for a long time. Do you think he's capable of that kind of thing? Look, I'm not going to make a judgment. That's up to commentators like yourself and others. You could have um, said yes. He's, uh, you know, he's the leader of the party. He will be the leader of the party.
but all of us have a responsibility to ensure that we represent um, the great cross-section of Australia as best we can. And lastly, Kevin, you know, I know you for a long while and um, I've never doubted your integrity and uh, your devotion to, uh, to public service. Getting demoted as you were, basically on the grounds you were conservative, uh, that must have been embarrassing, humiliating, must have made you very angry. Uh, Paul Hasluck spoke about the chance of politics and I've been on the front bench, the back bench, I've been in government, I've been in opposition. Uh, I'm staying on because I still believe I can make a contribution to public policy and the good governance of Australia and I hope to be able to do that on behalf of my constituents and more broadly the people of Australia in the next three years. A very Christian answer, uh, Kevin. <laughs> well, I try, to be a Christian, Andrew, I try to be a Christian. Well, you've lived <laughs> the faith in front of the TV cameras. Kevin Andrews, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure, Andrew.